welcome to my podcast. Today is Thursday, uh, August 27th, 2020, and I'm coming to you from the mountains of New Mexico with my usual fiber floss and fiction podcast in which I talk about knitting and today some spinning, uh, books and reading, and cross stitch. I hope everybody is doing well. If you are in the path of uh, Laura, Hurricane Laura here in the U.S., um, please be safe. It sounds very scary. Um, just the initial news reports of it already are not great. So um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed and keeping you in my thoughts if you are in that region of the United States. If you're a new viewer, welcome. I hope that you find a reason to come back and subscribe and visit with me again. And if you're a returning viewer, as always, Welcome back and thank you for choosing to tune in and spend some time with me today. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff to talk about. Let me get started on knitting and a couple of quick sort of administrative type notes. Um, the Advent kits are going on sale over the Labor Day weekend and if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook I will have information there about how you can purchase one of those if you're interested. Um, if you're not signed up for my newsletter, if you go to www.wollywonkafiber.com, um, you can contact me and I will be glad to put you on that newsletter list. Uh, I will be sending out, uh, I normally just do one monthly newsletter, but this uh, month there's actually going to be this secondary one to announce when the kits go on sale since we've got a limited number of them um, so folks are made aware if you're on uh, my mailing list you'll get that uh, first thing in the morning so you'll you'll know you can pop over and order those um, the stitches at home event that's happening in September, my yokes class uh, went on sale and sold out in less than a week. So thank you if you are somebody planning to take that class. Um, there's a new Facebook group that's been set up if you are somebody registered for one of the classes for the September event. You should have gotten an email about that and it's just a nice way to kind of introduce yourself or ask questions about my class or other classes. Um, for that event in mid-September. The good news is that Stitches Events has already decided that they should probably do another at-home event in October. So I will be teaching my yokes class again for that. I do not have specific dates yet uh, on when that's happening, um, but I will post a link down below to the Stitches Events uh, website so that you can visit there if you wanna take a look at you know other offerings for September and kind of bookmark it for October if you decide you'd like to take my yokes class um, so that's top-down yoke sweaters and we talk about all kinds of different fitting techniques um, things that you need to look out for in already written commercial patterns and give you kind of a base if you decide you would like to try to design your own or take a basic um, just plain vanilla type sweater and do some other interesting things with it uh, using that construction. So let's move on to what I've been knitting. I have two finished objects to share with you guys. We'll go with the small one first. Uh, this is another pair of socks. And these are sort of ringwood socks. Uh, they were originally, the stitch pattern was published in Nancy Bush's um, Knit Historical Socks, I think it's called. I'll link to it below. Um, but the original pattern in her book was for kind of men's size socks, and I like the stitch pattern, but the socks were gonna be huge on me. So I moved them from, I believe it's a 72 stitch circumference to a 64 stitch circumference. Uh, I used just a basic one by one rib and then I used the ringwood pattern on the leg and the top of the foot. I did a fish lips kiss heel and kind of my usual wide toe. So these are off of a sock blank from Gail's Art, which I will link to below. She's got some fun Halloween themed um, sock blanks up in her, sh in her shop right now. This colorway I did not see last time I was in there, but it's called Blue Daisy. 
And um, so these are sized to fit me, so like women's medium. Uh, but love how they came out. I think the colors are so fun. And I really like how this stitch pattern um, helped break up a little bit of the pooling. Um, the socks aren't matchy matchy. I think you can see that. I mean, they've got this kind of darker bronze section, but it doesn't exactly appear on the same place and the toes are kind of different. But I, it doesn't matter to me. I, it, they're close enough that I will certainly wear them as a pair and I'm thrilled with them. So another pair done for our 100 days of socks knit along. Um, and I was pleased to be able to use up that sock blank, which was a gift uh, from my friend Christina last year, I think for my birthday. I'm pretty sure it was for my birthday. Um, but totally perfect colors for me. So I'm super happy with that. Um, the next thing that I have finished is my Portage cardigan because it's been in the mid 90s here and what better way to celebrate that than a heavy wool kind of cardigan jacket with cables. Uh, this is a DK weight sweater. It is, uh, the pattern is by Melissa Shashwari. Um, as always, I will link to Ravelry patterns down below. Um, and I have knit this up using a new to me Blue Face Lester DK Weight yarn. Um, the colorway is Cinnabar, which is a new one for me that I've dyed. And here it is. I will model it at some point in the future, but it's just too darn hot here today. Um, love this front detail treatment with these great garter stitch pockets that come out of the shawl collar. Um, the back is this honeycomb cabled pattern. Tons of texture in that. Um, it's got raglan shape sleeves. So you can see those there, which are extra long, and I love that. Um, I, I really, really liked this pattern. There was only one spot in it that was a little bit confusing, but I powered through. Um, let me show you also. It has this fun little mini detail, which you really can't see in the in the photos on Ravelry, um, in the for the pattern. Um, but this four stitch rope cable that goes up what's kind of the side seam. It's not actually a seam because you're knitting the entire garment back and forth. Um, but love this. I will also link to my project page so you can see what it looks like on the mannequin. I don't have. Um, modeled photos yet for the said 93 degree weather thing. Um, this was tentatively scheduled to be the fall kit, fall garment kit for my sweater club that um, I had, I've been hosting this year. I was originally going to do a sport weight uh, garment, which is the next yarn size down, so slightly lighter than this one and I couldn't get this enough sport weight that I needed. They did have this BFL at the mill and I was like, perfect, let me knit the sample, make sure everything works out and then I can order a bunch and now the mill's out of this base too. So I don't know that I'm gonna move forward with the club. Um, I, I had bought a couple of kilos of yarn but it's enough for like two other sweaters. It's not enough for like, club worth of garments. So I may put this on hold for a while and we'll see if that comes back at some other point in time. But it is finished and I can wear my version and um, I, I really like the pattern and I, even though this is not really my color, um, I like it well enough. I'm gonna, I don't care. I'm gonna wear it all fall with jeans and it's warm and super snuggly. And the Blue Face Lester has a nice drape to it, so it kind of works out perfectly in this particular pattern. Um, so in the intervening time, since I have finished that, since the last time I talked to you, I have started another hopefully quick garment project out of long lived stash. And that is the Alanis Top by Elizabeth Smith Knits. This is a worsted weight um, top. It's the kind of rust color one you see there. 
Um, and I am knitting this using Harrisville Highland, which is their worsted weight, which is a great, I love this yarn. It's very sheepy and wooly and all good things for the fall. Um, I actually had these skeins left over from a design I did for my book, um, Free Spirit Knits. This was the Salt River Pullover colorway. Um, and the colorway is called Jade, even though to me it kind of looks more sagey. But it's got a ton of little heathery bits in it. And like I said, it's just it's just a great workhorse yarn. I wanted something that didn't have too much drape. Um, it has some once it's blocked, but I didn't want anything like a super wash merino. I wanted it to have a little bit more form especially for this section that's the uh, ribbed or garter stitch hem on it. Um, so I have cast on and this is a fun knit. It's got kind of interesting construction. Um, it is meant to be oversized and the pattern calls for 10 to 12 inches of ease, which is way too much for me. I don't like to swim that much in things, even when they're a layering piece. So I'm opting to go with the extra small size, which is the 40.5 uh, body circumference, which gives me like six to seven inches of ease, which is plenty, plenty for me. I I'm only gonna wear this over a t-shirt. If it's cold enough that I need an actual full sweater, I will wear a full sweater and so. Um, so this is the front and where I am so far. So it has a split kind of high-low hem. So the back hem is deeper than the front and then it has this gusseted opening where you, so you've worked the front and you've worked the back separately and then join them in the round. And it has this little vertical garter stripe section. So these go up the front of the sweater. And over here on this side, I have started the front of the little pocket. So the pattern calls for the pocket to be knit in a contrast color, but in all of the samples that I saw on Ravelry and indeed on this front cover sheet, the pocket hangs open, like it kind of goes this way to the front. And I'm just gonna do it in the same jade green that I've got going here. So the pocket lining will not be contrast. It'll be the same color as, as the garment. So I'm just working away on this. It's a pretty mindless knit. There's tons and tons of stockinette because the back is all stockinette. And once you get above the pocket uh, here, I have, I'm about halfway through the pocket depth. It all reverts back to stockinette on this side and you just have this set of four uh, garter columns. So I'm gonna be working away on that for a while. Um, I. I'm waiting to hear from the Ravelry Harry Potter knitting group if I am going to be sorted into a particular house. And once I know that for the end of the month, I'll kind of know what other projects I have on tap. But for the next four or five days, I'm just gonna work on that because it's easy, basic stockinette and very straightforward. And then I have a quick spin project to share with you guys. I'm trying to get back into working through some of my gorgeous roving stash and this is on that on that road, on that path. So this was originally a superwash merino roving from Pigeon Roof Studios. Uh, the colorway was called Storm Clouds and it was from one of her clubs, I wanna say like 2009, something like that. It's It's been in stash a long time. Uh, but just a great set of neutrals. I spun this as a fractal spin, meaning one half of the four ounces I spun with really, really long color runs, and the other half I spun with shorter color runs. So there'll be sections where, um, like you can see these right here. Not you, little guy. So like these two, they both are, it looks basically like a white yarn. It's it's plain, if you will. And then there's other sections where there's, um, you know, one high contrast, one low contrast color. 
So I'm thinking this is probably just going to be a pair of socks. I got 444 yards out of the four ounces, so it's spun to sock weight. And I think they'd be great as a pair of just basic ribbed heather, heathery socks. And since it's super washed merino, they should wear just fine. Um, not too worried about felting or anything like that in a pair of heavier shoes. So I have finished this. And hopefully you guys will see some more spinning out in the months to come because I'm going to try to get back in the habit of my 15 minutes a day one way or the other just because that makes progress even though it doesn't seem like it necessarily would for that little amount. So I enjoyed, enjoyed doing it and I got out of the habit and you know once you get out of the habit it's harder to get back in than it is just to stick with the habit. So... Um, yeah, so that will be on tap for this fall. So I think that's everything for knitting and spinning. I'm going to go on and we're going to talk about books. So I have three books to talk to you about today that I finished up in the last week and a half or so. Uh, the first book is called The Vine Witch, and I will put all of the books that I talk about, I'll put links to them in the descriptor box below that link to their page on Goodreads in case you're interested. Uh, I really wanted to like this book more than I did. It wasn't a bad book. It was actually a fairly quick read and pretty light. The premise of it is uh, there's uh, it's set in turn of the 20th century France, so just after the turn of the century. And the main character is a young woman who is a vine witch. She uh, is associated with a winery. She's grown up there. She's adopted. She's grown up there and she has come to learn the soil and how to make an amazing uh, vintage of wine and calling on things in both practical knowledge that are of the mortal world and of things that are kind of supernatural to improve uh, the health of the vines and to make a better wine. And the vineyard has been bought by, uh, a, he's not retired, he's given up his law practice. And he's bought this estate which has kind of fallen on hard times and doesn't believe in anything fantastical. He's all, he's all a man of science and he wants to run the vineyard just from a purely practical perspective. So the characters were fun and I liked the way that the author tied in the character Elena, the witch, to the land that she lives on and kind of their symbiotic relationship. Um, there's, of course, an evil witch thrown in there, which Elena is not. She's, um, she uses magic for the purposes of making the vineyard better, although she does also know black magic, which is part of the plot uh, that comes to advance the story along. Uh, it's just that there wasn't anything really new here. Um, I wanted there to be some fun little details that made this book really shine because I liked the characters and I liked the concept of the story. Um, but it's kind of a retelling of a lot of other stories about witches, so I didn't love it as much as I wanted to. But again, it was a fairly quick read and entertaining. So if you like stories that have sort of a practical magic, magical realism feel about them, you may like this one. Um, it's, yeah, it gets, the story gets tied to a close a little quicker and more easily than I would like it to have done. Um, but anyway, let's call it a B minus and we'll move on. Uh, the next book I read is called Under the Udala Trees. And this book, um, I, I'm still working on a challenge set of challenge prompts where you have to pick books that begin with a certain letter and you was the one for this which is hard, harder to find than you might, might think. Um, so I picked this one for you. This book was, um, so it's, it follows the, let's say from 12 to young adulthood, 
a story of this young woman who lives in Nigeria. The book starts in 1968 and this whole chain of events that in some ways come to shape her life, but there are many external forces that would have shaped her life regardless, are kicked off by the fact that 68 and 69 and into 70 um, is when one set of horrific wars were happening in Nigeria. And she is 12 at the time the book opens. The story tells a little bit about the history of the Nigerian war in 68-69, but it assumes that you know at least something about the basic political uh, history of the region. So I didn't, and so that was a good opportunity to do some googling and some reading and just kind of get myself up to speed so I would know what was happening or have a better picture of what was happening. So uh, her father is killed in a bombing raid at the very beginning of the book. And because of this, she and her mother um, are basically destitute. And her mother decides that she can't keep her daughter with her. And she sends her to live with two friends of her husband's, um, friends that he knew from college er era. So this young girl goes off to live with them where she's basically a house servant. She sleeps in a garden shed out behind their house. And she winds up meeting this other young woman who is a refugee as well and doesn't even know that she has any family left. And the two young women fall in love. So what transpires after that is the young woman's mother comes to find her and they move back in as a family together. Her mother has opened a, like a grocery type store, um, convenience type store. She has fresh foods, but a lot of canned foods and like household items that you would need. And so the book is about this young woman growing up uh, with a mother who is a um, devout Christian and who views her daughter's uh, life choices as an abomination and how this young woman is stifled by the culture in which she lives and a lot of traditional expectations and certainly a lot of pressure from her mother and how she makes her way in the world and kind of comes to find herself. This book was interesting to me because not only did I not know very much about the war in Nigeria in the late 1960s, so that was something I needed to go and learn more about, it also was um, kind of difficult for me to wrap my head around the fact that here in the late 20th century, when most of this book is occurring, um, it was still completely uh, suppressed to be somebody who was gay or had any other um, non-traditional um, sexual interests. And what I didn't know, but this book definitely talks about and illustrates, is the fact that um, any kind of variation from the norm can get you killed. And I know that that certainly is something that has happened in the United States. It's not that it doesn't exist or has never existed, but as late as 2014, which was six years ago, Nigeria has a law that being gay is a criminal offense. And in some parts of the, of their country, um, being stoned to death is still completely justified and okay which is a very different climate than most uh, he have to live through here in the United States, even though uh, it's not, it's still not an easy path. So a lot of learning in this book. Um, it's not an easy read and I, 
I'm glad that I that I read it. I mean, a lot of times the books that I pick up for challenges where you're just picking a letter of the alphabet, right? You know nothing about the book, and that was the case in this instance. Um, but it uh, was very well written, and you certainly come to empathize and sympathize with the main character. Um, it, it was written by a, a woman who is Nigerian, although she now lives here in the, United, in the United States. So there was a lot of things about the Nigerian culture um, in terms of things that they eat for breakfast and just how they survived kind of rebuilding parts of their country in the 1970s and into the 80s when this book is taking place. Um, just basic stuff like getting water and things like that. Uh, so it was a definitely an eye-opening read for me and if that is interesting to you I would recommend this book. I don't think it's for everybody to read and there is definitely some descriptions of violence in it. Uh, so if that's a trigger for you, please avoid. But otherwise, um, yeah, if you kind of want a little mind expansion, a recommended book. And then the last book I read was called The Mermaid and Mrs. Hancock. Mrs. Hancock. This is a historical fiction. It's set um, in the UK, in let's say London and its suburbs in 1786 and 1787. So the American War for Independence has just ended. And this group of people is uh, that the book focuses on are primarily middle class who want to strive for upper class. The two main characters in the book, um, Jonah Hancock, is a merchant from a merchant family. He owns several ships and he trades in the Indies as well as the Orient. And he imports uh, manufactured type goods, so things like China, like China teacups, um, and uh, dress goods and things like that. His well-trusted captain brings him back a mermaid and the captain has traded one of Mr. Hancock's vessels, sailing vessels, for this mermaid. It's a, it's a dried specimen, so it's being viewed as like a scientific specimen. Um, the second character in this book is a young woman named An Angelica Neal, and she is a high-class prostitute who has lost her protector and is kind of struggling to figure out where she's going to land in society. And the body house that she used to work in contracts with Mr. Hancock to show his mermaid uh, at a big party and he's invited as the guest of honor who's brought this specimen to them and the two of them meet. And so the book traces their kind of on again off again relationship and then how their sort of eventual get together but it's not a romance in the traditional sense of the word in any way shape or form. Um, it's got it's just chock filled with historical details from the time. Um, it's talking about the greater British expansionism and trade and the mercantile class rising to become the equal of some of the landed gentry and the members of parliament and things like that and sort of the equality of the classes, uh, that playing field is being leveled a bit by new money. So it this book has a lot going on in it. Uh, it's a fairly in-depth read. It's not particularly like a light, fast read about supernatural creatures. It's really more of a social history type book. And the author has used um, the symbolism of the mermaids to advance the story about the body house, the prostitutes that work within it, and their place in society as well as the up-and-coming merchant class. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I actually listened to it as an audible book, which was fun, um, and would recommend that version. It was well read and like the voices were good. The narrator did a very good job at keeping all the characters very separate. Um, the main female character 
was interesting because she's somebody that you want to root for, but then there are points of the book that you just really don't like her. You don't like the person she is. Um, she is redeemed in the end. She becomes she becomes a very strong, uh, capable woman who seems to have a good head on her shoulders. So I like the fact that she was uh, had more to cheer for by the end of the book. So we'll also recommend that, uh, again, historic fiction is what I would call it. Um, it's not really fantasy, although there are some elements of is this a real thing, is this a not a real thing that kind of circle around the concept of the mermaids. Um, but the rest of it is historical fiction. So a good read and one I enjoyed. Uh, I just have started rereading uh, Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, which I haven't read in quite some time. I think I read it when I was maybe 15 uh, and had forgotten what a good book it is. So I'm rereading that. And I just started a new book by Alice Hoffman, one of my favorite writers that's set in the World War II time period in Berlin. So more on those once I get through them. Um, but for now, let's move on and we'll talk stitching. So in stitching, I've got several things to talk to you guys about. Um, let's go with the small one first, because that's easiest to show you. Um, I worked one day on the Pilgrim this month, like I'm trying to do every month. This is a Long Dog Samplers design. And that's what it will look like when it's finished. Uh, I am stitching this uh, one over two on a 36 count linen from Crossed Wing called Butternut. And I am using a Silks for You hank that is mostly what I would consider periwinkle. It's got some lighter blues and purples in it. And whoops, so you can actually see the whole thing. There is where I am currently. So this is the bottom, uh, one of the bottom center pages. I am all but done with this page except for one little bit up here in the corner, but I'm gonna wait to do that when I can continue to carry the motif because this is a big frog. So when I can work the motif that way, I'll keep going. So I've moved over to work this way, and this is the left bottom corner of the design. So this page will get me to the edge of the bottom edge of the, of the design. So I worked on this kind of thistle-like motif in this go-round and then moved myself over with that. I don't know if that color is exactly right. Better, maybe. Um, yeah, that's probably closer in real life. So love working on this one. I don't have any specific like finish goals or page goals or whatever on this for this year. I'm just working on it once a month um, with Kim over at Spartan Stitcher. Um, we don't necessarily work on it the same day, but we're both just doing a day at least a month uh, on our long dogs. So really enjoying this one. Love the colors in it. Um, it is very nice to work on a piece that just has one color and not have to be switching floss back and forth every so often because um, I have lots of projects with lots of colors, which you're about to see. All right, so that's that little guy. That was just one day's worth of work and it'll be out again in September, but uh, again, nothing, I'm not trying specifically for a finish or anything like that. All right, let's talk about a stitching shelf. I am, well now I feel like I need that light back on. Sorry you guys, obviously. I cannot make up my mind today. All right, here's where we are on this. I'm obviously working on this page. I got about 1600 stitches put in it uh, last weekend and just working to finish that. After this page, I have one more full page and then like a three column page to finish this top row. So I have this um, marked out. I don't think it comes out in September, but I think it's on tap in October to work on. Um, 
yeah just I enjoy working on this one so much I love these beautiful colors back up so you guys can see the whole thing this is the regular size chart it is neither super size nor max color it's just the regular and that's where I am on that guy And then I brought up, um, I don't, I didn't have this to show you last time, but it is the Desert Mandala by Chatelaine. So this past time that I worked on it, I came over here and I have finished this border down to here. That's, that's done. I have beads to do in this section but the either snakeskin or braided leather latigo i'm not sure which it is uh border is done the cross stitch is done in this border i have both the feathers finished up and i have started on the snake this is the rattlesnake right here so there's a matching vignette um, to the bunny so there are the saguaro cactus that will come kind of across here and then there's a snake coiled here in the center that has a ton of beads. So I felt like I got pretty far on this. Um, my goal for this year is basically everything from this cactus up. So this top 25% to finish that much this year. And this is slated to be out for another 1,000 stitches in September, which I think will get it pretty close. And if it doesn't... My plan is to either keep working on it, working on it, or pull it back out to get this finished up. I think it's. I think there's just the one. Is that right? I think that's that's it for um, for our challenges. I have a thousand stitches marked in marked for it. I'll have to look ahead because if I have a second thousand stitches, then I'll wait and do that the month that that comes up, whenever that is. But I think 2,000 stitches ought to finish up that section or get me pretty darn close. So I'm, I'm feeling good about getting that goal done for the year. Um, I am currently working on Joan Elliott's Winter Fairy. It's down on my frame, so I did not bring it up to show you today. Uh, I am trying to work on that very focusedly, with great focus between now and the end of the month. So I've got three, four more days to work on that. Uh, today, tomorrow, actually more than that, today, tomorrow, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So five days to work on that. Um, I am down through her skirt and I will show you where I get to next time I come back to talk to you guys. Did want to let you know that if you are interested in full coverage, the Full Coverage Fanatics Facebook group, and I will link to that below, uh, we are doing a Confetti Conquistadors weekend, the first weekend in September. So that's going to be like the 4th, 5th, and 6th. If you've got a full coverage piece, it can be a new start or it can be uh, a whip, your choice, as long as it's full coverage. We have an event thread set up there to come and join us and work on uh, a project that has a lot of confetti in it. So I'm going to be working on my super size max color once upon a fairy tale because there's oodles and oodles of confetti in that sucker um, and see how far, see how far I get on that. Uh, minimum goal for next month on once upon a fairy tale is 2000 stitches, which I also think will get me fairly close to a page finish but maybe not quite there. I don't, I think I've got more than that left to do on that, that page that I'm working on. Also coming up in full coverage fanatics, uh, we uh, are going to be announcing our 2021 challenges and stitch alongs. Uh, we've got a bunch of new ideas that are coming your way for the year next year. Some are counting, some are non-counting events. We're trying to uh, do both options for folks who don't like to count, although I know there are a lot of you who do full coverage who like to count. Um, so there'll be a mix of those things and I'm going to start getting those uploaded to the Facebook events page uh, soonly after the turn of 
the month to get us into September. So you'll have those to plan and talk about and all that good stuff. Um, going forward, let me get my little book out here. Okay, so in September, um, what I've got on tap is uh, Desert Mandala, which you guys saw that. I've got a thousand stitches to put in there. I've got 2,000 stitches to put into Once Upon a Fairy Tale. Those two challenges are for the semi-sane stitchers around the world. Uh, in September, in Full Coverage Fanatics, we're going to be visiting Norway, and I am going to haul out my Long Winter's Nap ornament and get the page finish on that. So close. I just need like two days, I think, to focus on it. Maybe three, but we'll get that done. Um, so that's going to be kind of those, that set of things is my, is, are my priorities for September. Uh, and then whatever other time I have, I'm going to, I've got two projects that I still need to focus on. One is Winter Fairy and the other is my Christmas morning pets. Um, my husband and I have a short vacation planned in the month of September. I just still don't know if we're going to be able to go. Uh, if we are, then I'm going to focus on Christmas Morning Pets because it's way more port portable than Winter Fairy. Um, and if not, I'll work on Winter Fairy because I feel like I can get the Christmas Morning Pets done at any point in time. Um, I was looking ahead to next year. Got to find my list, list of stuff. Um, and what kind of goals I was looking for next year. And I had been going back and forth about kind of what I wanted to focus on and what I felt like were good choices to try to get stuff finished. And I think um, one of the things that has been sort of tripping me up is by the end of this year, assuming I finish Christmas Morning Pets and assuming I don't start anything else, although I do have one new, two new starts planned before the end of the year, the bulk of my current whips are all massive. There's stuff like Desert Mandala, um, The Pilgrim that you saw, that's 12 pages. <coughs> My Teresa Wensler Harvest Sampler, uh, Huckleberry Farm that I started, uh, Celtic Wheel, I've got another Joan Elliott Fairy, um, Summer Sampler that you guys saw in my last videos. I got a lot of big stuff and not really very much small stuff. Um, so thinking about tackling those was kind of making me feel a little bit overwhelmed. And then as a sidebar, I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I currently have six full coverage pieces and I'd like to start a seventh next year. So trying to figure out how to work on nothing but big projects was a little bit daunting. So I have picked a few very small, small projects that I think I'm going to start and use as kind of little palette cleansers when I need to. But I think what I'm going to try for next year is doing a ten, blocking out 10 days a month on a focus piece that I would either like to get a certain goal met. So like for instance, um, for summer sampler that you saw last month, I have pages one and two, which is the top of the six, I think it is. Um, finished so basically a third of that project done so 10 days a month on a focus piece doesn't have to be 10 consecutive days I might do five and five or whatever but 10 days seven days on one full coverage and seven days on a second full coverage and then that would leave me six to seven days of other things to work on so I could work on another big project if I was kind of getting close to a finish or wanted to see a certain amount of progress on it. I could work on a small if that sounded better uh, or I could go back to working on a full coverage piece. My choice. Um, and I feel like if I do that, that would give me four to five projects a month. It would give me enough time on any of those that I would see actual progress. Um, I don't, so one of the, one of the challenges that we've got planned for Full Coverage Fanatics has a lot of stitches in it. You don't have to do all of them, obviously. You can pick certain parts of it that you would like to work on. 
Uh, but working towards that as a goal, um, there's a lot of stitches that I could do in full coverage next year. And so I'm kind of leaning towards having a month that has mostly full coverage focus and then one other non-full coverage focus piece that will take up most of my stitching time during the month and see how much progress I get. It's always changing, right? I mean, part of the fun of the planning is to figure out how things are gonna fit into how you like to stitch and what your personal goals are and figuring out how to make all of that work together. Um, so I think that is it for this go round. Um, I hope you all again are doing well. I will plan on talking to you likely in a couple of weeks. We'll see what my schedule's like. Um, I am going to be, I have a whole weekend that I know I'm booked to teach the 12th and 13th of September, um, for the stitches event that I talked about in my knitting segment. So not totally sure when I will fit a podcast in next, but I will be back fairly soon. And until then, I hope you all are staying safe, staying well, um, staying sane with homeschooling or out of the path of the storm if you are in our uh, Gulf states of the United States. So until I talk to you all again next time, be well. <laughs>